Christopher, Grant, how you doing? Good afternoon. Good. Sweet. Over my uh, food coma. <laughs> yeah, that was that was great lunch, honestly. Um, all right, so we we heard a lot about some infrastructure being built from some great founders, um, but the fact of the matter is, these brilliant teams and founders they need support, they need partners, and they need funding, and that's where the venture capitalists come in. And I got two of the. Uh, best firms, I think, in the Bitcoin e ecosystem today with us right now. Um, we got 1031 and Trammel Venture Partners. And um, I think if you take a step back the last three, four or five years, um, all of these big firms, they went straight into all this quote unquote crypto, right? The A16Zs of the world. They were investing in, you know, fruit supply chains on the blockchain and all this crap. Um, but you guys took a different approach. Uh, you guys were Bitcoin focused. Um, so let's talk a little bit about like a 30,000 foot view of why you guys took that stance way back then when it was unpopular and where you see the thesis kind of going out from here. Let's throw it to Grant and then uh, Christopher. I, I think um, really to start uh, 1031, we formed it because we were Bitcoiners and for me, I was lurking behind the scenes, trying to learn as much as I could about Bitcoin. And I was also doing some angel investing um, while I was working professionally as an investor at a private equity firm. And I was really interested in Bitcoin and I just happened to come across actually Unchained Capital was raising some money. And to me, it was a light bulb moment where I was really interested in investing. I love supporting companies. And I was a Bitcoiner and I believe that Bitcoin was the ultimate foundation for what we want to build upon and create new infrastructure for this world. And so I wanted to form a platform that would support these companies because when we were talking to the companies, and I'm sure Christopher will say the same thing, you hear from the Bitcoin companies that they're very particular about who they're looking to add onto their cap table. They don't want to add a crypto fund. They don't want someone who doesn't understand the importance of Bitcoin. They don't want to add somebody who is going to suggest they support other altcoins. And so it made natural sense to me. It aligned with my passion for Bitcoin, but also there was this large gap in the market where there was tons of crypto funds out there that were pumping altcoins and not really understanding the fundamental innovation that we have with Bitcoin. And the founders of the Bitcoin companies were looking for aligned capital. So for us, that was a natural fit. I'd say a little bit of our background, you know, we've been around since the very beginning, orbit of Bitcoin and seen a lot of waves of entrepreneurs that wanted to build something on Bitcoin. Um, one of our earliest investments, uh, Kraken, we invested at the Series A in 2014 and 2015 when it was called the Kraken Bitcoin Exchange. Um, they've uh, have some new lines of business these days, of course, but um, there's been a sentiment, and you mentioned A16Z and some of these others. I've, it's The irony has never been lost on me that you might be a portfolio manager at a massive firm, literally managing as an individual more than a billion dollars of other people's money, and yet might not have an intrinsic feeling and sense of what the definition of money is. Um, that's a wild disconnect for someone that's responsible for a whole lot of it. Um, there was a sentiment that's still, frankly, bandied about left and right. You just have to pay attention to crypto Twitter a little bit by these other investors that the innovation's not happening on Bitcoin. Innovation's happening in Denticoin or what the, the, the fruit supply chain. Okay, <clears throat> maybe the activity seemed at a slower pace. Maybe the internal rates of return for being able to put some money in, get some, maybe you want to call it money, maybe not out in a couple of years time. But if you have the view that Bitcoin has already won the battle for the internet's base monetary reserve layer, if you see it that way, you most certainly want to be extremely purposeful, very methodical to induce any changes at the risk of doing violence to Bitcoin core and ruining the whole thing. That said, and, and I think on the last panel, they mentioned uh, SegWit. SegWit was a technical prerequisite to the Lightning Network. 
progress has has happened. It's been very purposeful. You know, we people that are far smarter than I'll ever hope to be in engineering look at core. They make these determinations, you know, and over time, you know, back uh, November 21, Taproot was uh, was merged as well. So what's actually happened while these people that are investing elsewhere have been saying that the innovation is not happening here, a very, very clear process and a layup to expanding the composability, the, the buildability directly on the Bitcoin protocol stack, it's actually happening. And I'm glad that at least for now, um, most of them still don't recognize it <laughs> um, because those founders, like you were saying, Grant, they do, they like the alignment, they like the principles. And so, um, yeah, I think it, it's happened that way for a reason. If you come in, you're a new investor, you're like, let's start writing checks and, and you end up in crypto. Maybe you're just not going to get it. But um, it's happening now. And what is happening is extremely exciting for Bitcoin. And, and I would say most people not seeing it is a dramatic understatement. You know, we look at how much capital has been raised for strategies like Christopher's and myself. I see Andy in the audience as well. There's other investors that are pursuing this Bitcoin only investing strategy. And less than, I think less than $250 million has been raised for these type of strategies. And you can easily say over 100x that has been raised for crypto oriented strategies that include venture oriented investing like what we are doing as well as just hedge fund type of trading activity to prop up these other ecosystems. So there's over 100 to one mismatch in the capital that's been raised um, in this ecosystem. Probably over double that, I think, actually, you know, the, there's a billion dollars in the NIDIG round alone, for example. So um, huge disconnect um, with the growth, though, with, with what's happening and this renewed excitement of people are like, oh, shit, I didn't know I could build that on Bitcoin. It's starting to happen where people are starting to tinker. There's a new sense of, of play among the engineering, the developer community, and, and it's exciting time. So um, with that little amount of capital, with this expansion at the same time of of a huge playground to build in Bitcoin and Lightning, um, you can imagine what's going to happen over the next few years. So how do you guys see this changing? Because I feel like right now we're entering this period where there is the growth of the Lightning Network and the entire ecosystem right now. And there's this application layer getting built out that could provide a lot of value um, for investors as well as the community and users. Um, do you see these other crypto firms like going into this and understanding this? Or do you think the siren song of cryptos where they can just print money and then dump it, I call it the insider exchange dump, and they make money really quickly but do you see that changing now with like the regulatory environment and see them kind of putting more money towards the Bitcoin ecosystem now? Or do you think they still are just so far away from understanding these dynamics? I think there's still time before they really understand it. Um, the common theme that I heard after you started to see all the collapses last year um, from, you know, some of the people that were considered, you know, the, the quote unquote smartest guys in the room was that actually the problem wasn't the focus on crypto is what they were saying. The problem was CFI, centralized finance. And they said, well, the solution is DeFi and, um, and continuing to invest behind some of the crypto projects that they are. I think what we've seen is just with FTX, BlockFi, Celsius, Voyager, Three Arrows Capital, um, Genesis, the list goes on there was over $100 billion of enterprise value completely evaporated. I think over time, as more people get burned, um, they will start to learn. But I, I certainly haven't seen um, an entrance from crypto investors into this ecosystem. I mean, I mentioned BlockFi. Um, BlockFi, I think, raised $1.4 billion in their history. And that's, that's probably 10x what's been raised for um, venture oriented strategies in the Bitcoin ecosystem. So in one deal, more than 10 times the capital that, that we're using to support the Bitcoin ecosystem was completely wiped out. Uh, I think to your question, maybe it is, and this is, I'm just, I'm thinking aloud yeah. that with 
the time preference orientation of the Bitcoin community with what's possible, maybe some of the factors that drive a new wave of adoption and for founders that are maybe they're thinking, I can only do this in some you know, other smart contract platform, uh, Ethereum, Solana, et cetera, that if they're actually thinking about something that is coming from a place with a sense of mission, they want to really move the needle for humankind for the next 30 years with that long view on what they're actually wanting to build, I think there's actually a natural alignment with Bitcoin um, to, to move and do it there. Like you, you, you don't have any guarantees uh, with Solana that needs to be rebooted as a network every couple of months. Um, and we can probably get into talking about platform risk a little bit. Um, that's an extremely compelling reason for a founder with all of the all of the personal risks they would assess by starting a company. Uh, opportunity costs, I could make a half million dollars somewhere else or a million dollars, but I wanna to dedicate to building one company. I'm gonna do it for 10 years, and after 10 years of my life, it might fail. Um, you know, it, it, there's a, an untalked about personal toll that can happen for, for founders. You know, you're, you're, you're putting in 19 hours a day for years of your life. It can uh, affect relationships, this kind of stuff. So in, in the sense of face of all of those risks that you have to take as an entrepreneur, the very last one that you're going to take if you're actually building something for the ages, and that's your view, is a platform risk. Of, of something that might not be there. Maybe it's it's captured and shut down by regulators. Maybe it, it just fails in terms of its ability to stay up. Um, zero chance that a smart founder is going to build and take platform risk in the face of all the risks that they actually ha have to take um, already. And we're, we're starting to see that now. Well, there might be a entrepreneur or a founder in the audience or listening at home. Um, and they might be wondering, what do you guys look for when you're thinking about investing in a company or a founder uh, before you put capital to work with them? I mean, the, the, for me, the first thing that comes to mind, I always say this is finding people who are trying to scratch their own itch. I mean, that's what, that's what I was trying to do um, when I co-founded 1031 is I was looking around, I was seeing a need for more capital to come into the space and leverage the experience I had to help founders in the space. And pretty early on when we started, we started investing in early 2020 in the ecosystem. And once we had eight or nine investments uh, under our belt, we started doing a look back on what were some of the common traits um, among the companies we had invested in. And there was a lot of, you know, you could look at um, a lot of these founders were very mission oriented, but they also were trying to solve a problem that they were experiencing. And that's, that's for me, one of the most important things that I look for is finding someone who's so passionate about a problem that they're seeing that they want to go build something behind it, because then, you know, you've got someone, or then you can at least assume that you've got someone who's willing to stick through the tough times, because as we all know, this, you know, you go through um, you know, bull, bull cycles, bear cycles, and um, you want someone who's dedicated to, to, to fixing, you know, something that they're experiencing themselves. Yeah, passion for sure. Um, coming from a place that's informed by their experience or professional experience, pattern matching and seeing something that's, that they feel like is at the cusp of being enabled due to the nature of the Bitcoin and Lightning Network itself, um, from something they've done in the past, uh, like like a Lyle Pratt um, at Vita Global, who's thinking about the Lightning Network as this massive global communications network, and he spent his entire life in telecom, and so he's building something. You know, in that in that sense, also something that's very very big. Um, you know, there's there's a place for uh, smaller projects, open source uh, things, developer tooling, and a lot of those fits. But you know, we're looking for you know, things that can be global recognizable brands in 10, 15 years time. So really big uh, opportunities. And um, we're not afraid to take an early, you know, hard swing at something with the right team that's coming from a place of experience and domain expertise. Yeah, the, I'd say, Christopher, I'm sure agree is like the investable landscape in this emerging Bitcoin ecosystem is, is um, 
hugely, hugely significant. The way we, we think about it is that, you know, if, if, you know, there's a lot of people here, I'm sure, who are interested in Bitcoin and think, you know, for certain reasons, it's monetary characteristics that it's going to play a more important role in the world going forward. Well, what does that mean? That means likely you, you might have uh, a view that there's a possibility that Bitcoin is, you know, there's increased adoption. You might have a view that there's a probability. You might even have a view that it's a certainty. But if there are going to be more uh, users of Bitcoin and holders of Bitcoin, then those users and those holders are going to be looking for more products and services um, that meet their needs. And those needs are incredibly diverse. It's custody, it's financial services, it's lending, trading, it's payments. We had Jack Dorsey or Jack Mahler's uh, uh, here earlier talking about what they're doing with payments and remittances. There's consumer applications, there's security infrastructure. How can you hold your Bitcoin safely? Um, you know, there's, um, uh, a whole host of, of applications. And so really any, th any company and any founder that has an idea to provide a product or a service uh, to Bitcoiners, which will be a growing group um, over time, that is something that uh, we want to invest behind because increasingly those will be businesses that can monetize for that product or service and increasingly earn Bitcoin um, in exchange. Well, let's talk about the investable landscape a little bit. Um, you just brought up a couple examples, but I'd love to hear just in specific segments of the ecosystem. What are you guys excited about? It could be a specific founder, a specific company, maybe a product or service that's coming out. Um, like, let's maybe start with like mining. Do you guys have any interesting comments on mining or what you're excited about in that part of the ecosystem? Being energy money, it's been a long held view for us that in the end game, it makes the most sense that energy itself be priced in sats. Um, you know, as a result, companies like Sonoda in our portfolio that are moving the needle forward toward that eventuality and maybe the producers of energy are thinking in dollars, they have um, operations in dollars denominated, but kind of bridging us over to a time where they can be like, you know, I've been receiving dollars, but I could actually flip a switch and take some portion of this and put directly into cold storage for the company, for the, the, the energy producers of the world. Um, I think that's a really important step forward toward that. Um, it's, it's huge. And so for us, uh, you know, we look at a lot of mining deals, um, kind of have an internal view on what the right one would look like, but uh, haven't deployed directly into an operator, uh, but we definitely have exposure um, to mining as a result of a company like Sonoda. Yeah, uh, I, I agree with what Christopher says. Uh, what Sonoda is doing is very interesting. Um, we've backed a number of mining infrastructure uh, related um, businesses. We're also mining directly into our fund. We have um, some stranded gas um, down in the south where we leverage that wasted energy uh, to mine Bitcoin. So there's some companies that we're supporting that are doing um, um, similar activity like that, such as Standard Bitcoin is one that we helped incubate. Um, we support Upstream Data, which provides a lot of the uh, infrastructure for oil and gas companies that are looking to uh, leverage what would otherwise be wasted energy assets to mine Bitcoin with that. And so to us, we really like the idea of supporting the decentralization of hash. Um, that I think is, is potentially a threat vector for, for Bitcoin. Um, and so, you know, I think with Bitcoin, there's this natural um, synergy with the mining and energy uh, related players um, to help uh, eliminate wasted resources, which is incredibly powerful for the environment as well. And let's let's move on to lightning, because uh, over the past couple of years, lightning growth has been pretty great. Uh, when you just look at any kind of metric, uh, Bitcoin capacity, uh, number of channels, um, really whatever you look at, it's been up and to the right. Um, even with the price action, it's been one of the positives last year. Uh, and there's so many applications that are being built on Lightning. There's so many interesting things happening. I mean, you could look anywhere. You could look gaming. You could look uh, way it's changing communications. What are you guys excited about when you're looking at companies building on Lightning? Anything specific? 
In, including the tech stack itself, you know, we're, we led the seed round for voltage. Um, you know, it's critical lightning infrastructure for rapid application development and deployment for other companies to then build on. Um, we've done some application layer uh, companies as well. For the last, you know, roughly 12 to 18 months, is kind of a strange, maybe unexpected thing has happened where um, with the lighting network itself, the, the network itself is growing, but in parallel, applications are starting to grow um, on as well. It's a little bit of a, a virtuous uh, circle kind of a scenario that doesn't necessarily happen in exactly the same way um, all the time, but it's, it's, a, it's kind of an interesting phenomenon. So um, we're certainly looking at a lot of different applications. There's a whole lot in particular around, um, you know, distribute or implementations of the Lightning Network like LND that uh, are gonna be enablers of things that are just literally months ahead of us, just a matter of months. And so that's gonna cause an explosion. I, I think what's really exciting is to your point, Lightning Network is small uh, in the grand scheme of things. By comparison, you know, just to, you know, kind of gut check on where we are, if I haven't looked this week, um, been uh, prioritizing uh, banking uh, questions. Uh, but, uh, you know, like last week, uh, it's like 5,500, 5,600 Bitcoin um, put productively to work in the Lightning Network. By comparison, uh, in, in Ethereum, uh, know thine enemy, right? Uh, uh, something like 165,000 Bitcoin are tied up in wrapped Bitcoin alone. Um, so if that gives you any indication as the applications drive demand for usage, channel capacity and liquidity in the network needs to increase to service that um, what's going to be happening over the next few years. So it's extremely early days, but also very exciting, but um, nothing compared to what I think it's going to be over the next few years. Yeah. And on Lightning, the, what I would add is that I think Lightning will enable new business models, um, new applications that we haven't seen before, because with Lightning, as as um, Jack was saying earlier, you know, you can now send transactions, a digital bearer asset uh, in a much smaller denomination than was possible under, you know, the fiat monetary system. So what does that unlock? That unlocks the ability to infuse payments in, in new and innovative ways. We've seen it um, with some of the podcasting apps. We've seen it um, being infused in some of the newer open communication protocols like Noster. Um, and you know, I, I think there's still a lot more that we can't even imagine what will be done. You know, one of the companies in our portfolio that uh, is is doing some pretty exciting stuff um, is a company called Stackwork, which enables a remote workforce that can do micro task, consider it like a, a mechanical Turk type of business um, where they can enable um, people who otherwise are unbanked, do micro tasks. It's, it's often training in AI, which there's some trends around artificial intelligence as well, but they may not have a bank account, but they can, if, as long as they have a mobile phone and a connection to the internet, um, they can earn Bitcoin as compensation. That's a, that's a really interesting use case that wouldn't have been possible before. And, and I'm not sure, I see a lot of new faces in this crowd, which is awesome, um, but I'm not sure how technical the crowd is, but just to kind of put a bow on what you're describing there, Grant, you know, imagine the way that the legacy developer ecosystem tends to work is that a company will expose certain possibilities through APIs and you can make a call um, on the API that usually gets bundled into a subscription-based model. Um, but if you can imagine what's been happening in the AI space where there are bo uh, bots providing certain kinds of services, um, there are actually other machines in the world that probably need some sort of monetary settlement. So, you know, when we, when we used to have cash in our pocket, maybe you had pennies, but we're talking small fractions of a penny for some tiny little expression of value where there's, uh, it's actually possible to move that value around and, and fully final settlement when it, when it arrives there. And so the intersection of these uh, payments and va small, tiny value transfers in real time, um, we just think that this is the future of how the world realizes payment on the internet full stop. And so um, super exciting. And you can see really quickly how the demand could explode. Yeah, and I like what you were saying, Christopher, about it's a gut check. Like we're so, so early. 
Um, but there are tools being built every day. And I, I was really bullish when Breeze came out with their recent LSP, where they're sharing liquidity with the third parties to improve liquidity conditions in Lightning. They also have their STK. And then you have uh, like Block taking their Bitcoin and putting it to work in Lightning to improve liquidity. So I do like those kind of bullish developments. But maybe let's talk about um, some of the risks that you guys see that maybe you you aim to address when you invest capital, um, whether that's in Bitcoin itself or in Lightning. Um, what are some things that maybe are like, okay, I want to invest capital here to try to reduce some of this risk for the ultimate success of Bitcoin moving forward? Well, one thing that comes to mind for me is just more of a current topic. It's um, something I've seen over the last year is that really proven out the, the, the thesis behind having a Bitcoin only strategy and the companies wanting those type of investors, because with all the collapse in some of these crypto businesses, um, most investors who don't really understand Bitcoin and what are the important issues to be navigating there likely would, you know, have their hair on fire trying to navigate the times with their companies. You know, Christopher mentioned um, dealing with banking relationships right now. I mean, that's a topic that's not just important for Bitcoin companies. It's a topic that's important for everyone. Um, but I think having that understanding of um, custody, why that's important. Um, the other implications for some of these businesses that are nuanced relative to someone who doesn't live and breathe in Bitcoin, um, that to me has been something that's, that's really proven out over the last few months. This is kind of a simple example. I think some of the risks to Bitcoin still have to do with, um, you know, fundamental risks have to do with just simple UX. Uh, you know, I think Talking about payments, everyone. If you drive through Starbucks, um, I'm 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 still I find myself giving cards when I make payments a lot still. But you know, a lot of people just hold up a QR code. It comes out of Apple Pay or it comes out of um, what's effectively a wallet that's controlled by Starbucks and uh, sits as a liability on their balance sheet until you spend the money. Uh, and the turnover, getting it to be so dead simple that our mobile experience we've come to use everywhere else. Um, comes ho home to uh, small payments and transactions in lighting, like building that, the process of facilitating the infrastructure that underpins it, the applications to implement it, the UX research that smooths it so it's just seamless and the, the average user isn't thinking about, oh, I'm, I'm using big, like, oh, I'm using dollars uh, or renminbi or whatever it might be to purchase something. We can't ask users to think about any of that. And so I think, Grant might agree with this statement that before there was Bitcoin native venture capital, um, the fact that uh, building these companies and proving these things out, that, that there were risk in building the companies around solving these sorts of things, you know, just the existence of people that are willing to take some risk with their own capital um, actually is a de-risking factor across the board, which um, we're happy to participate in. But um, yeah, I think the UX thing is something I still think about a lot. Yeah, the, the other one uh, for me, just in terms of specific areas that I think are worth um, support from a capital perspective and development perspective, um, you know, Justin Moon was up here talking earlier about Fediment and Fedi Pool. Um, you know, the centralization of uh, mining pools. I mean, that is, um, you know, that is an area that um, could give uh, some concern. And so this new idea around Fetty pools, I think is, is really interesting. And I think we'll look to support that. Right on. Um, well, we're out of time, fellas. Uh, so I appreciate the comments. And if there's any entrepreneurs out there listening, I think you guys would be really lucky to talk with these guys. Um, they could be helpful. So reach out to them or get in touch with them any way you can. And um, thank you for supporting Bitcoin only companies. Uh, I really appreciate it. I'm sure everyone here does. So thank you. Our pleasure. Thank you.